Live from the Austin Convention Center in Austin, Texas, it's The Cube at Dell World 2014. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Hi, everybody. We're back at Dell World. Matt Eastwood is here. He's a group vice president at IDC, focused on a lot of stuff, compute, workloads, cloud, third platform, which is IDC's branding of this sort of next generation of computing. Matt, welcome to theCUBE. Great to have you. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. Happy to be here. So, Dell is a private company. It's all the buzz. You've seen the stuff that Michael wrote leading up to this, and you know, the, the, the articles in the trade press. He was on CNBC this morning. Talks about the great icon and sort of tongue in cheek. Um, from your standpoint, what's it mean for Dell to be private? I mean, obviously a huge news item, but, right. but does it change anything? Um, I think you know, the, the biggest change for Dell is um, it ha they have flattened out the organization somewhat and they're able to go uh, faster. And I think the, the big thing I see technologically from Dell since they went private is a, a enhanced focus on partnerships and you know, kind of deeper engineering partnerships. You can see they've done with Oracle, what they've done with Red Hat, what they're doing with um, Nutanix even. So there's, there's been more of that. Uh, but really what it, the, the advantage to Dell, or the benefit of being private, is really being able to kind of hide some of the impact of the experimentation in the business from, uh, from the market. So a lot of the re-engineering re of Dell that has to happen on the inside really is um, on the sales side. So can, if you start to think about the market and these market forces around, say, third platform, mobile, social, cloud, big data, how those come together and how we start to think about selling somewhat different solutions to somewhat different people and also in a different way, then that takes different skills. And so there's a lot of focus on, uh, on retraining uh, the sales force and the go-to-market and how they think about channel, um, all of that. And, and I think um, there's, there's experimentation happening and you can hide a lot of that under the covers as a private company. There's some, um, so you've spent a lot of time in the world of compute and generally in servers specifically. I've spent a lot of time in storage. Um, things like compute and database got kind of boring for a while and they're really getting interesting again. Um, the, I guess the move toward virtualization sort of exposed some of where the value is in the server business and you saw some really interesting times. Real focus on market share. Right, that's right. <laughs> um, which I'm sure made your life very interesting. Um, and now the ODMs are coming in to the, to the play and cloud is coming in with what you guys call third platform. What's happening in that world of compute? Well, you have, I mean, so just the very essence of, you know, compute starts to change. So the question starts to become, what is a server? And when you start to think about even the roadmaps that are coming at us from, say, Intel, around, um, around kind of rack scale and this disaggregated notion of a system, you know, getting beyond a, a, a physical piece of sheet metal defining a system into, into something that's defined more at the resource level across a rack becomes pretty interesting, but I think um, you know, today, if I think about the server market and the compute market and what's changing the most, is there's a really a heavy emphasis on consolidation and virtualization in traditional enterprise data center, traditional workloads. And then of course there's significant amount of growth and capability and capacity happening in the world of hyperscale or web scale for these new generation of workloads, these highly dynamic workloads. And so you start to see the com where the compute lives and, and what type of data center environment it lives in is changing pretty dramatically, and that has architectural implications. Do, do those two worlds collide, in your view, or do they, do they stay largely separate? Um, today, today they're very much still separate. I mean, if you talk to a, to a customer, the conversation's still fairly fundamental. It's does this workload fit best in a dedicated environment or a shared environment, and does it fit best on-premise or off-premise? That tends to be how they think of it. Uh, and that leads you to decisions around what that what the system might look like architecturally. Um, over time, uh, we think that the whole notion of uh, what a cloud is and what a cloud looks like begins to change, and it becomes much more um, seamless and, and somewhat less visible to somebody that's actually operating a data center. 
Make, you're going to make it fun to count, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Matt, Matt, do you do you break down by application type? You know how much compute there is. I, I guess I heard, heard in a recent analyst segment they said, you know, there's going to be certain applications that you're just going to leave in place until you can finally retire. There's some that we're going to migrate over, and virtualization helps there. And there's some that we're going to rewrite. Um, you know, we, we, a lot of attention's been placed to the, the ODM. Uh, you know, information that you've put out there. Break. Uh, break what, what are some of the numbers and the sizes today? Uh, you know, th th that you can break down for so, us. So we um, we do. We we for 15 years or so um, have done annual workloads research where we look at what's actually consuming the um, compute capacity as well as the storage capacity in the systems. And those uh, broad categories are everything from uh, you know business processing where you'd have your ERP and your LTP and your batch to a kind of a decision support framework around data warehousing, data analytics, uh, collaboration, you know, messaging, and, and things like SharePoint and groupware. Um, you get into um, core infrastructure, file serving, networking, security, uh, web, web infrastructures, technical computing. You run that and you, you actually see that the compute landscape is actually pretty diverse when you start to look at workloads. Um, and what's changing is these workloads are going from say something in the traditional world, and using IDC terminology, say around second platform, that tend to fit inside a socket. So those are workloads that are being consolidated today into these virtual environments. And then you have these more dynamic uh, scale out workloads that are emerging, uh, say the world of, of uh, Hadoop and of analytics that behave very, very differently and consume uh, resource very differently and actually need to be able to uh, uh, take on resource and give resource back to a pool so you get into these um, kind of pool-like uh, you know, thinking around the resource. And, and the third platform, can, can you say just from a, from a unit standpoint, what percentage of, say, compute is that today? So I, I'll, I'll take, take the question this way and say that um, one of the things we did with our workloads research this year is we, we made the, dis the distinction that you have really two big encampments. You have traditional enterprise and even service providers, the hosters, and you know you can get to that type of workload through surveys and conversations with traditional customers, but then you have these web scalers that look very, very different, and you really can't get to them through surveys. And we estimated that in uh, 2013, about just under 25% of all the servers went into um, into web scale environments. So those those are the you know the Googles, the Amazons, the Microsofts, the the bats in China, and those workloads today are very infrastructure heavy. So what you tend to see from a workloads perspective is, you know, to use kind of a, a traditional analyst tool in a two by two matrix is an assessment of business value versus cost. And there are clearly workloads that, um, you know, are going to continue to fit in that traditional IT model because they don't consume a lot of resource and, and you can just leave them alone. But there are workloads that are very, very resource intensive and very expensive to, uh, to manage and maintain and those tend to fit more in that um, kind of you know dynamic cloud-like model. So you'll see a shift in the hyperscaler world away from workloads that are really being defined by mobile and consumer and into more enterprise class workloads over time. That 25% is, um, we're talking units, we're talking dollars, we're talking MIPS, it's, MIPS it's, nobody uses uh, that anymore. It, it's a unit measurement okay. and, and actually the, the revenue behind it would be, would be less. It would okay, actually so probably be more like 15% uh, of revenue because you, if you think about where the high-end systems are, the mainframes and the Unix, what's left of that is all in traditional enterprise. And so today, the server market in the first half of this year has been about 80% x86 and is these are revenue and 20% non x86 on mainframe and Unix. Um, so still you have a market that's in unit terms overwhelming the x86, but there's a lot of value out there that's on these other platforms. So thinking about the the TAM, the, whatever, the, the IT TAM, let's say it's, I don't know, two, a trillion, two trillion, some huge number. How big is the compute sort of portion of that? And I know it's, it's changing, because you get the converge piece coming yeah. in, but we're talking about, what, a hundred billion dollar market? I mean, um, compute market, the way we define servers today, it's about 50, 52 billion. Okay. Uh, if you add all the pieces together, if you take um, compute, uh, external storage, which wouldn't be in the server numbers, right. And, uh, and traditional networking, it ends up adds up to about a hundred billion. About a hundred billion, yeah, and, a little and, bit north of that. And then, and is it growing? Um, it, uh, it's growing it? uh, at a relatively slow rate. So, so let's low, call it flat. Low can single digits, flattish. So call it flattish. But there okay. are clearly shifts inside that inside that profit pool. And that, that shift goes to a cloud slash hyperscale and other certain segments within the enterprise. Or? And and even maybe to take take a different look at it, if you think about um, what's happening in the market mentioned ODM earlier, um, 
you have very different margin profiles in, in this in this market. So if you think of it from a profit pool perspective, you know, you've got mainframes and Unix, which are going to still have pretty nice uh, profit margins associated with them. The x86 market has, to the uh, server vendor, typically thrown off 20 to 25 points of gross margin. But in the world of, of ODM or even the world of a hyperscaler, they're buying systems in the in the single digit margin range. So okay. it's very different. And they don't buy. <laughs> They don't buy software, they don't buy services, they don't buy financing, so it's a really difficult market to make money in. Okay, so now let's bring that back to Dell. Where's Dell fit? What's Dell's, what, what do you talk, talk about Dell's strategy. Uh, they can certainly thrive on 20% you know, margin. They, yeah, they, yeah. They're happy with that, I would presume. Anything yeah, yeah, and Dell, north of that. You know, Dell, you know, seven years ago, they went out and created a, a, a data center solutions business to go after and to learn from what was happening in the world of hyperscalers, so they started to engage at an, at an engineering level with these hyperscalers. And what they're doing now is taking a lot of the learnings from those conversations and trying to apply it to a more, more commercial design. Since so you could even see that today with FX2, they took some of, the, uh, some of the learnings from what they've been doing with hyperscalers in terms of how they think of modularity, how they think of density, how they think about energy efficiency, and apply it to some of their designs. So um, for Dell, you know, Dell's always been exceptionally strong in the mid-market. And if you, when you, when I followed them as a public company, you always saw that their their margins uh, for Dell as an overall entity were much much better. In um, in when I say mid market, I mean uh, large large small businesses to to small enterprises. So it's maybe 500 to 5,000 employee type companies. And they also tend to do pretty well in government, uh, but they've tended to have lower margins in enterprise because they they haven't had the level of attach there. That they get a mid market, and they've also had lower margins in, in small s and small business. So there, for Dell, it's about pushing that out and trying to take that footprint that they have with PowerEdge and attach more networking, more storage, more security, more software and services to that. And and, and I presume that's you would you would agree that's the right strategy. What would you tell Michael Dell? Uh, say, hey Matt, what should I do with my you know my core server business and my my networking slash converge business. What would well, you tell them? I mean, Dell's in a, an interesting position because if you think about, you know, to use another kind of overused term these days, software-defined infrastructure. Um, really, and Michael talks a lot about this. You know, the, the notion of the server in his mind that's PowerEdge, you know, eating the storage or the server eating the network. Mm -hmm. That's really all through software, and um, he's in a position where, to your point earlier, Dave, where he can operate. Uh, happily at a lower margin than maybe the competition that he's going after with that strategy. So if you're a, a Cisco or an EMC and you're selling software, but also software that's that's traveling into market with uh, systems that have 50 or 60 points of margin, that's really the target for, for Dell. Now, the, the, the question is really how quickly does the traditional siloed buying in an enterprise change to something that's a bit more horizontal? And generally speaking, I think this market moves in evolutionary terms. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it doesn't happen as fast as people. But do you buy that notion that the server's kind of eating eating in? I mean, for years we saw the storage sort of suck value out of the server. It does feel like it's coming back with Flash and right. Cisco, what they did with UCS, and now the whole converge trend. I mean, it seems like servers is a good place to be. It is a good place to be, and and even the term commodity around servers is an interesting one because. It's certainly not commodity if you're Intel and you're getting 60 points of margin on, on <laughs> well, Xeons. Right? Been, but, hardware's but, been commoditizing for 30 but, years, but you know, there's but, still money but to be made. I would say that all the players in this market um, have to have a compute strategy, the, it, because it is a pretty important component of how this market behaves dynamically. Um, you may not want to have a high volume compute strategy, you might, need, you might want to have a very targeted high value strategy, and certainly when you get into conversations around software defined or even uh, uh, converged infrastructures or integrated infrastructures, that becomes a pretty important component. I know you're not a storage guy, but you think EMC needs a server strategy? Or does um, it already have I, one with I, VMware? I think that EMC very much, uh, shouldn't, they shouldn't shy away from playing and compute where they need to. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them doing more of that. You know, as they bring VC into EMC, and VC, in my, my view, becomes their converged brand, if you yeah, will. Right, sure. I think you'll start to see, they'll have to have some computer, yeah. Evo, e even with Evo. Yeah, right? Matt, so. we've talked about from the Viper standpoint, uh, EMC as ECS, uh, with the Evo, that they, they have their own server, so, and those, EMC not only owns the EMC part, but they own the VMware part. So the question I have for you is, as we look, Dell's placing a lot of bets when you talk about converge mm -hmm. and software-defined. 
when you look at things like margin, you know, can Dell make enough money from all of these bets they're placing? They're partnering with VMware, they've got the Nutanix OEM, they've got money in Nixenta, uh, and you know, on and on and on. From a cloud standpoint, I'm getting questions on Twitter saying, this cloud broker thing, I don't know how Dell makes any money on buying VMs on you know, Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud or things like that. So what's your, what's your take on how it, Dell makes money? And, and, I mean, and maybe to answer that question, I'll go back to the question that David asked about you know, my advice to Michael. I, I, would, I would tend to say that Dell has gone exceptionally fast as a private company to do a lot, a lot of partner, partner type deals faster than ever, but maybe that gets you questioning about focus and whether or not you're in too many, in, uh, too many camps. And so I think that's a legitimate question. And I, I, I do think that the way they're thinking about it from an ecosystem perspective in that you have a VMware ecosystem, you've got a Microsoft ecosystem, and you've got this kind of open source, open stack, ecosystem that they're going out after with Red Hat are all legitimate places to be, but your question, Stu, is, com is, completely, is, is completely fair because how much opportunity is there for Dell to add value there and capture additional profit pool out of those uh, partnerships is a good question. And it's, I think it's early days, it's hard, it's, it's time will tell uh, if they're able to get enough unique value for Dell to be successful in, in that type well, of thing. You know, I think this is one of the reasons why Dell had to go private because it's it's throwing off so much cash from its PC business and it will throw it throws off cash from its server business. It can use that cash to make acquisitions in software, it's make right. acquisitions in services. It's probably got close to a ten billion dollar services business with the you know the old Perot business. Uh, uh, and the software business is approaching two billion dollars. And and if they can keep that you know, growing and make more acquisitions, they can shift the margin mix and live off their, their cash flow. Uh, and, and I think, and I think the, the privatization uh, effort was timed almost perfectly, and I don't know that it was, it, it was completely intentional, but the valuation that Dell was able to place on the business when they took it private happened at a time when the PC market was really in the, in the, in the dumps. And on top of that, they got great, uh, great uh, value on the debt. So they got a great rate on the debt. Right. And they've seen, you're right, they've seen this, the PC market bounce back. Uh, and I don't know that any, everyone would have called it exactly that way, but there's a great opportunity in the next 18 to 24 months to capitalize on a refresh that's happening in commercial PCs. Think about you know, the end of support for XP. Even on the, and then on the server side, even um, what's going on with Windows Server 2003, and the shift into, into the need to refresh and update a lot of those architectures. I mean, I, I, you're right. I mean, the timing of that was perfect because it, it was timed with the headlines. The headlines couldn't have been worse right. at the time. And so they, they got the, the buyer, self, self Dell, got a great deal, in my view, and it's going to make a lot of money off of this, <laughs> as, is, as is Silver Lake. Silver Lake just has a knack of, of doing good deals. And if you know, they're, they're able to, uh, so far, pay down the debt faster than they actually had budgeted to do. And I think they're, they're saying two and a half billion down already in the first half of the year. Right. So the debt will go away relatively quickly in the next couple of years. And they don't have to pay dividends, they don't have to do stock buyback, so they shouldn't be constricted so from should acquisitions. Be, there should be a lot right? of free cash there, right, to, to be able to play with. And I think that's a, you know, if I think about maybe an area that Dell probably will be very active in uh, M&A, and it won't be, I don't think, I don't see a big M&A, but you know, tuck-in deals, um, acquiring IP that they need. So if you think about the way Dell works today, they have um, they have a ventures business. They also have a labs business that they've set up recently, and they have. Um, so they, when they think about investment, they're thinking about where the gaps are in the portfolio and where they have to tuck in technology. I see security as being an area where there's a, you know potential for investment from Dell, and then anything data oriented, data management, or uh, you know data analytic oriented. It seems I agree. To make security, really good sense big for them. data, the whole IoT things. They could connect yep. into yep. that. I mean, they could definitely make a lot of little. And they've been they've been pretty successful with their with their acquisitions. It wasn't their acquisitions weren't able to transform the company fast enough for the street. But you think about the transformation that Dell has engineered for the company. It's it's pretty astounding. And the other thing. What if you can comment on this? Is they can craft any story they want as a private company. They can mix terabytes and units and dollars and global, you know, countries and say we're number one here and there, and really don't have a way to unpack that. Right. You know? right. I mean, you know, I mean, that's your job. And I, think, I guess, but, but, but you know, it is. It's a. It's a challenge. It's. It's valid. I, so my my advice to Dell has been that you know they they can use and, and you tweeted on this earlier. They can use IDC data and Gartner data to to tell a story. But I do think that 
Dell has to face the market uh, maybe twice a year and provide somewhat of an update on their business. Well, it's going to be for interesting. For the press and for How the analysts and for our customers be. and partners. I, I, right, we'd like to see that, obviously. Maybe the, uh, the European standard with a little less yeah, granularity. Yeah, yeah, yeah it wouldn't be what they showed previously, yeah. but, but give people some a good peek under the covers at what's going on Do you think they will? Um, I, I can see them looking at some of that next year, yeah. Selectively, yeah. maybe. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> I mean, they already, I, I just um, met with uh, with Tom, the, the CFO, and, and they're already doing this with their with the debt investors. Yeah, like sure. People, and they, have, they still have quarterly calls there, but that's uh, more detail than you probably would see in something like this. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so Matt, just a, a detail question for you is, Dell seems to have done really well over the last year from the server business, but you know, IBM just went in the transition to settle Lenovo, the ODM seemed to be coming on strong, Supermicro, uh, you know, underneath, you know, is Dell server business in trouble? How do, are they placing you know, solutions in enough of the marketplace and, and have enough differentiation to keep, keep this growth going? They still, Dell still definitely still has um, opportunities to grow and compete. If I look at, if you, if you look at the server market uh, broadly, and you kind of ask why, you know, why IBM picked now to do what they did, I, I would, I would actually argue that IBM should have done this maybe two years sooner. Uh, but it's a couple things. One is the the overlying, the the overall market for x86 servers is more predictable now than it was. Uh, five years ago, it's it's flattened out, right? And it's eaten into the market. It's at eighty percent. Is it going to get to ninety? Sure, but it's going to take some time to get there as you eat into those high value workloads. But really, you have a couple things that have been happening in in the server market that have been interesting. One is Cisco coming into the market and now having about five points of share in the market all up, but putting pressure on the higher value of, of x eighty six on IBM on on HP. Um, then you have the emergence of of China as a market which is really sourcing from local Chinese OEMs, from Huawei, from Lenovo, from Inspur and Sugen, and you have the emergence of the ODMs as well. So you have, you have these kind of three forces that are, that are working on the market that are putting pressure on, on the traditional uh, competitive ecosystem. Well, and, and right now, Dell's capitalizing on the turmoil IBM x86 sale. I mean, the resellers were not happy about that, and we all, we all know that story. But Lenovo could emerge as a really formidable competitor here, yeah. don't you think? I think they, and I, I think they can, and I think they will. Um, I actually think what, so the, the, what will happen in, in, is there will be a period of transition where IBM, the part of the x86 market that IBM really always aspired to have was the higher end. Um, scalable x86 blades, and that's generally where they carved out their niche. Lenovo, I think, will take a very different approach. They're going to very much focus still on convergence, but they're also going to go very hard at volume and build a volume business, and that volume business will also include hyperscalers. So I think you'll see a very different Lenovo emerge in the market over the next few years. And of course, there'll be some places where they, they lose out. I think there'll be you know, some nationalism, some government type uh, buying, maybe HPC type buying that won't stay with Lenovo, mm -hmm. or that will go to, to competitors. But I think the upside for Lenovo is, is more than the downside. And you, you will see some adjustments in the portfolio over the next two years, but if you look out three to five years, I think you'll see Lenovo as a very formal And they align competitor. more interestingly with Dell than say did an IBM they or, do, they or do. an HP. Well, anyway, overall, uh, great assessment and, and, and session here on uh, sort of unpacking the, the business and, and looking at Dell's prospects, Matt. So we've got to leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on. Well Thanks done. for having me, Dave. Appreciate All right. it. Pleasure. Pleasure. All right, Pleasure. keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE. We're live from Dell World 2014. We'll be right back. <laughs>